Welcome to the day one summary, summary session. I'm Dr. William Bowerman, a member of the ILAR Standing Committee. I'm a professor and chair of the Department of Environmental Science and Technology at the University of Maryland. I'm a trained wildlife ecologist and environmental toxicologist who specializes in population impacts to wildlife species, focusing on birds of prey. I am an ornithologist and serve as the vice chair of the Ornithological Council. The National Academies Convened Standing Committee for the Care and Use of Animals in Research is charged with engaging with stakeholders regarding new processes, formats, and topics for future updates or additions to the Guide for the Care and Use of Laboratory Animals. As introduced earlier in the day, the guide, now in its eighth edition, serves as an important basis for operation of animal care and use committees. The Standing Committee is not an advisory or oversight committee that will make recommendations for changes to the guide. Rather, it provides a venue for the exchange of ideas and knowledge sharing among those involved in scientific research and animal care and use in the academic, government, private, and nonprofit sectors. This workshop is extremely useful and important for informing the work of the Standing Committee. I hope you join me in thanking the organizing committee and speakers for a very impactful day. Over the next hour, each of the three session chairs will be provided 15 minutes to provide an overview of their session and address a subset of questions you asked throughout the day that we think are particularly important. After our third chair has finished, the final 10 minutes will be a combined opportunity for synergistic discussion and cross-cutting questions. Our first chair is Dr. Anne Maglia, whose session was entitled, Perspectives on Animal Welfare Considerations Between Lab Animal and Free-Ranging Fish and Wildlife Field Research. Dr. Maglia. Hey, thanks so much, Bill, appreciate that. Uh, so our session was really the uh, opening uh, uh, part of the uh, workshop largely to frame uh, the, rule, the goals of the workshop to provide uh, some context. And uh, Bob Sykes started us out with a really great overview, um, uh, presented some history of wildlife research uh, related regulations, identified some high, le high level challenges that um, subsequently other folks have talked about during the day uh, in more detail. Uh, I then gave an overview of uh, the, nation, the U.S. National Science Foundation wildlife uh, portfolio of funded wildlife research, uh, generally as a way to um, highlight some of the diversity that we see in wildlife research, not only in the uh, kinds of animals, but the kinds of research and uh, kinds of procedures um, and settings, and, and identified um, some challenges that um, some of the um, funded PIs at NSF uh, have encountered. Um, Carol Clark from the uh, United States um, uh, Department of Agriculture then talked about um, Animal Welfare Act specifically, and also talked about some considerations related to um, wildlife research. Uh, Nicolette Peterberry also spoke in our session and she talked about um, from the perspective of the U.S. National Institutes of Health's uh, Office of Laboratory Animal Welfare. Um, they uh, specifically she talked about policies and challenges um, in uh, regulation and in um, um, conducting wildlife work as it relates to OLA regulations. And finally, Jeff Wyatt closed us out by presenting uh, from the perspective of ALAC International and talked about accreditation and wildlife animal welfare challenges that uh, ALAC um, also um, uh, deals with. And so I, I think the, you know, for our section, session, it was largely just a, um, an opening context. Uh, we had a couple of questions, I think, um, that, um, were pretty interesting. A few of them. One was about um, remote data collection. You know, when when would you need um, IACUC um, review? For example, if you were using a helicopter, you know, would that would that need IACUC review? Um, another one was about the number of times to um, 
handling in animals, what's appropriate. Largely the, you know, the answer to that one is, is more, um, you know, try to minimize the impact of the animal. But I think the most interesting discussion that started in our session that continued throughout the, um, the course of the day was about the use of personal protective equipment in um, field work. And we saw a number of different uh, folks uh, both talking about not using it and also using it specifically. Um, so I would actually like to turn this over to Bob Sykes and see if uh, Bob, if you could uh, make some comments on uh, PPE and wildlife research. Sure thing. Um, PPE is certainly something that investigators and IACUCs need to be concerned about, both for the protection of the personnel and also for the protection of the animals. So what types of PPE should you use? That really depends on the type of the study. The PPE needs to match the, the, the risks. Um, you, first of all, you need to be cognizant of what those risks are. And, and it, they also need to match the um, intended use of those animals. If it is lethal capture, perhaps you're capturing the animals by hand and what have you, and it's lethal capture because they're going into a collection, then you're not releasing those animals. You're not as worried about introducing something into the environment. So gloves may not be as much of an issue there. What would be a, an issue, especially uh, in certain environments is contaminants that you may bring in on your boots or on your, your clothing. So um, as a number of speakers have, have uh, touched on with herbs, the decon procedures when you move between sites, I think is very, very critical. Um, I think um, viewers should also realize that many of the slides that were used, uh, the images that were used may have been collected over a very long span of time. I know uh, for my own presentation, some of the images that I reached out and grabbed were actually scanned from, from ectochrome slides or kodachrome slides from long ago. So some of those images may span 30 or, or perhaps even 40 years um, when we grab that slide to illustrate a specific point. That aside, you've got to really match the PPE for the risks and the risks are going to be situation dependent. Um, in working with mammals, for example, I will take working with rodents in Arkansas, I'm not terribly concerned about hantavirus. I know it's not much of a risk here, if at all, it, it's not been reported within the state. Um, on the other hand, if I'm working in other parts of the US, yeah, there are very different risks that come into play. So it's matching the, uh, the PPE to the risk for that situation. Just got to evaluate and be cognizant of those risks. Great, thank you so much, Bob. Uh, I know we have another, uh, several other folks on um, on our side that were speakers today. If there's anyone else that wants to um, comment on this, I'm certainly happy to uh, uh, cede the floor to you. Um, Heather, maybe uh, you can uh, join and talk a little bit about um, PPE in general in the field. Hi, sure. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Thanks. Um, I work with a lot of undergraduate students at the university level, and often our students are um, joining the field for the first time. They don't have a lot of experience, maybe in the outdoors in general. And so we talk about some pretty basic PPE um, to keep students safe. Um, and one of the most important things is heavy boots because um, sometimes I have students that want to wear flip-flops in the field. Um, and so we talk about um, just working in the desert. It's a hot environment. So we need to protect our, our bodies from sun and spines and um, maybe venomous animals. Um, and so sometimes it ends up being really basic stuff, um, sunscreen, drinking water, um, things of that nature. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, another question that came up uh, during our session um, that we didn't get a chance to answer was um, was about uh, especially in remote sites or in um, you know in field settings. How does an IACUC best meet their semi-annual facility inspection oversight requirements? So I'm going to ask uh, Jeff Wyatt if you would be willing to um, take this one on. Sure. Thanks, Anne. Uh, thank you very much. 
Uh, I've, I've seen eye cooks around the world accomplish this in many ways. And remember what we've heard throughout today is that there's no one size fits all, uh, that each eye cook really needs to look at what's uh, best for them and feasible for them to uh, uh, achieve the goals that they have, even typical for um, a semi-annual facility inspection or program review for a mouse facility. You know, animal welfare, animal well-being, personnel safety, uh, that, you know, all of these, um, all of these um, program activities, you know, they, they validate that those are being uh, achieved as they've been described in the protocol. And, and um, the many ways I've seen this happen include uh, uh, videos, camera, uh, photographs, uh, while the uh, program is um, active on site. I cooks really enjoy seeing that. It's just like the presentations we saw today. Uh, updates, progress reports. I have found at uh, one university I work at that uh, the researcher loves, they love coming to the iCook and giving in-person updates and progress reports. And you know what? That gives the iCook an opportunity to do some Q&A. Just like when we visit a mouse lab, you know, we'll, uh, we'll ask some open-ended questions and then we can truly validate that um, everything is happening as we um, would expect. So I think, I think it really is, um, it's, it's personal to each eye cook, but the common theme is that, you know, we're really all looking about promoting be, uh, best practices, promoting welfare, promoting good science, uh, be it a, a mouse program or a, a field research study. Great, thank you. One other question that uh, came up uh, several times throughout the day that um, it's a little bit in the weeds, but I, I think that because it um, came up over and over again, I think it is important to just bring up to reiterate. And that is that, you know, when IO cooks are thinking about um, if, if they should be um, requiring protocols for for wildlife research. And you know, we know that a lot of times IACOCs may not have the expertise as, as we have heard throughout today. But um, I'd like to ask uh, Nicolette from the perspective of let's say Ola, and then maybe Bob, you can follow up if, if you'd like. Um, what kind of information should the IACOCs be gathering? What are the things that we expect um, to see so that the IACOCs can make that determination? Okay, so we do have an FAQ on this, and that is OLA FAQ A6. And at a minimum, of course, the IACUC is always free to ask um, PIs to elaborate, but um, they should know about the location, the procedures, how the procedures are likely to affect the biology and the ecology of the study animals. Um, and there should be an assurance that permit requirements are met. And Remember that the IACUC is also responsible for looking at occupational health and safety concerns. So these are things that I think are important to ask about. Um, regarding written documentation, this is really important, not just so that the IACUC has a written record for compliance purposes, but a form or a written record of IACUC evaluations can be critical for publication since many journals now require some form of IACUC documentation or some form of review. Excellent, thank you. Bob, do you have anything you wanna to add to this, especially from the PI perspective? Sure, I'll just add that uh, I think having the asking having a protocol form that asks relevant questions is a first step. That's kind of the first pass for the uh, oversight body to be able to review these activities. Um, and, you know, obviously an institution is, is able to tailor this to fit their needs. I will offer that both the Ornithological Council and the American Society of Mammalogists have template protocol forms that are wildlife specific on their websites that are in word format. Um, these were developed together and then we kind of split them apart and went a little bit different way each society, um, but they're in word format so that anyone can download these and modify them to suit their institution. They're long because we tried to make them very inclusive but we encourage people to at least look at them if there's a question or two that is important or if the entire uh, approach is, is important to your institution, then feel free to use them. Oh, thank you, Bob. Uh, anyone else in that first session? Anything, uh, any last comments or things we'd like to bring up that uh, we haven't talked about yet?
not hearing any bill, I think uh, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you very much. Our second chair is Dr. Uh, Sharon Shriver, whose session was entitled Review Laws, Regulations, and Permits Associated with Fish and Wildlife Field Research, followed by Case Studies and Examples. Dr. Shriver. Hi, thanks so much. Can you hear me okay? I assume so. <laughs> so for session uh, two in part one, we had three speakers. Um, Adam Ferguson from the Field Museum of Natural History talked about animal welfare challenges um, from a natural history museum perspective. Um, some of the key points that he presented were that the regulations are extremely complex and that the regulations themselves can tend to drive research agendas, especially in relation to collecting for museums. He presented an analogy of developing a research activity as being like a game of Candyland, where many different obstacles are encountered along the way, and the response to those obstacles determines the direction that the project ends up taking. Many of these obstacles have unclear rationales, and those may have evolved historically or emotionally rather than being based on scientific reasons. Um, he talked about how uh, museums represent a unique situation where lethal sampling is the norm and specimens are meant to be used and shared. And keeping the regulations grounded in biology with a consistent dialogue between regulators and scientists will encourage ethically sound research and scientific advancement moving forward. Uh, Adam's presentation was followed by Lori Baton from the National Park Service, um, who talked about the many challenges for wildlife reviews within the National Park Service system, um, including the fundamental question, uh, does this activity require IACUC review? These challenges may be logistical, political, or due to a lack of defined oversight. She described the development of a decision-making model to help define research versus management. Um, this model provides really clear definitions and identifies decision points in order to provide direction. And she urged reconsideration of animal welfare considerations for the release and reintroduction of wildlife from captivity. Our final speaker for part one was uh, Caleb Hickman, um, who spoke about research on tribal lands. Uh, he talked about how partners of shared boundaries or visiting researchers must understand the legal and ethical sovereignty rights of tribes. Uh, he talked about how the concepts of natural resource management and land ownership are different for tribes. So it's important to carefully consider research that includes tribal perspectives. Tribal lands may represent highly biodiverse environments due to their long history of management and connection to native species. However, tribes are disproportionately overburdened and consistently underfunded. So animal care and use processes are often unreasonable, leading to reliance on partners and ultimately decreased sovereignty. Session to... Uh, Part two, I'm sorry, I was just checking my, my messages here. Um, I'm gonna pause here and um, see if anybody, um, any of these three speakers have any comments they'd like to add um, from their presentations. Okay, so if not, I'm gonna move to uh, part two of session two. Um, where we had three speakers who presented case studies um, and examples of their own work and how these related to the laws, regulations, and permits that we talked about in session one. So our first speaker in session two included um, Lisa Tell, who talked about the unique challenges she's encountered working with free-ranging hummingbirds as a case study. Um, her key points included the fact that researchers who work with free ranging wildlife had the added responsibility of thinking outside the box to ensure the health and welfare of the animals, the research team, any students involved, and the public. 
She talked about the increased uh, time, effort, administrative tasks, and pre-planning that are commonly inherent to performing research that involves free-ranging wildlife. Examples she provided included situations where a single project may require a diverse collection of overlapping and non-overlapping permits. Another challenge can be conflicting requirements, such as when the IACUC wants to see a permit before they'll give approval, and the permitting agency needs to see the IACUC approval before they'll grant the permit. Uh, she suggested that investigators might need to advocate for the animals and their proposed research and help educate the committees and approving bodies. These efforts might entail the researcher having to actively educate themselves. Uh, Lisa's talk was followed by Larry Heaney from the Field Museum, who uh, talked about the discovery of new species, 40 to 50, for example, 40 to 50 previously unrecognized species of mammals are being discovered every year. By definition, these efforts to find and document such species require permits and IACUC approval that's flexible. A great many species are known only from a few specimens. We know they exist, but we don't know much else. And producing this produces a similar need and support for the most basic kinds of research. He showed how data pr produced by these studies regarding the existence, distribution, and habitat of species um, are essential for conservation assessment and planning, especially in an era of habitat loss and climate change. Such data are currently lacking for many species of tropical mammals and other vertebrates. He described field work that produces this data and how it's often conducted in remote areas where conditions are difficult, including places that are the homelands of indigenous peoples whose cultures must be respected, even when these differ from those of Western societies. And our final speaker for this session was Heather Bateman from Arizona State, who talked about uh, field research involving reptiles and amphibians, remote study sites, and undergraduate students. She talked about how communication with the IACA can be very helpful when the unexpected happens. Uh, an example she provided included some necessary changes to capture methods due to unexpected predation or to a wildfire at a study site. She talked about including undergraduate students in research and how this can benefit students through encouraging critical thinking and exploration. Ultimately, this can be important for the future of the STEM workforce. And she talked about how engaging with students requires sensitivity to their backgrounds and experience and care and training for safety in the field. Um, so I'll ask our speakers if they would like to um, jump in and ask anything. I know um, Heather already spoke to you a little bit um, during the summary from session one, um, but I think uh, Larry would be um, happy to provide some additional comments now. Sure. Uh, the one thought that has occurred to me that uh, I think uh, may bear even more emphasis that it's than it's received already is this notion of collaboration and respect for the people who we work with. Um, this is something that uh, can be difficult, uh, challenging uh, when we're working within the United States, when we're working in other countries and in very different cultures. Um, it is even more important uh, when we go overseas, we're, we're going as their guests. Um, we, I think, are obligated to uh, respect their ways of doing things, uh, their priorities. Um, and that extends from uh, respecting their official uh, laws and regulations um, to respecting the, the uh, traditions of the, of the people in some often remote areas where we work. Um, uh, this notion of um, uh, what uh, is sometimes referred to as helicopter research, uh, where people uh, just drop in, do their research, and leave, is something that I think is very destructive in the long run. We all need to be working together um, on these kinds of issues. And that uh, ends up imposing some very important constraints on the way that we do things um, with our, our uh, work with, with uh, animals uh, in our research programs. Um, and that means that in order to be able to move ahead with the research that we think is important, having a degree of flexibility um, with the way that we, we treat these issues um, becomes critically important. 
No, I, I think that that's probably clear already. Uh, I don't think I need to give any more examples, but uh, I'd be happy to talk about it more if people wish to do that. Thanks, Larry. Uh, Bill, I think I can pass this uh, back to you for a summary of the next session. All right, thank you very much. <clears throat> Our third chair is Dr. Patrice Klein, whose session was entitled Wild Animal Populations Concerns. Dr. Klein. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I hope I'm audible. That sounds good. So again, I am Pat Klein, I'm the USDA Forest Service IA Cook Attending Veterinarian and the National Program Lead for Fish and Wildlife Health. And again, I'm delighted to have been the moderator for session three, where the main focus, as you have heard, has been on biosafety, field safety in general, biosafety, biosecurity. And we've had a lot of questions related to that over the course of the day. I do wanna also again, thank our speakers, Chris Parkinson, Jonathan Reichard, Karen Lips, Vance Vandenberg and John Bryan for their excellent presentations. What I've done is I've sort of distilled sort of a composite of the key issues that um, I heard today. I hope those are also the same that you have also identified. We know that our speakers um, highlighted the dynamic and complex and often dangerous risks in doing wildlife research activities, actually both in the field and in the laboratory. And uh, Chris talked about that with venomous reptiles. Uh, also, just the risk of introduction and spread of wildlife diseases inadvertently, of course, by field researchers and others, and the impacts on biodiversity and species conservation. And we had some great presentations, certainly by um, Karen and, and Vance, and also John Reichard. Uh, another big topic we talked about was the importance of this dialogue between the, the principal investigator, the IACUC committee members, the OC Safety and Health, or EHS committees, when we start to pull together what are the appropriate biosafety or field safety protocols for particular studies. And actually, John Weicker did bring up the idea of developing standards of practice around biosecurity, biosafety, and animal welfare. And I mentioned as well that these are all about what we call the One Health principles that we use throughout our careers and throughout our, hopefully, our professions, that we are all interconnected. So whether we're working in the field or in the laboratory, in any of our, our work and personal spaces, we need to realize animals and humans, we live in a shared environment. Uh, there's lots of opportunities for pathogen spread. We have to look at those interfaces, we call them, those intersections where we can interrupt potential disease cycles or prevent them from even occurring. And this regards situational awareness, right? To understand what are the types of health hazards that we might be facing in the work that we're doing in going into the field to do work with wildlife or bringing them into the laboratory. Uh, what are those risks? They can be physical, they can be chemical if you're uh, working with chemical mobilizing uh, drugs or they can be obviously biological. So that's where we have these risk assessment tools and those were talked about in uh, John Reichert's presentation when he talked about white nose syndrome. We talked about the risk assessment tools, particularly what we call the just in time risk assessment tools when you have a new and emerging infectious disease and you need to actually go into the field and understand the discovery of what's happening. We didn't know what was causing white nose syndrome 15 years ago. We had no idea until people actually took the time to go into the field and work through some of those issues and also bring some of those animals into the laboratory and look at what the pathogens were. Same thing with the B-cell, BD, ronavirus, all of these emerging infectious diseases need to have the science for, the, for understanding to make good management decisions and, and disease control decisions. So all of this takes training and, and vigilance as a constant. So some of the key points I just wanted to identify for the audience, uh, again, in, in sort of a composite of all these wonderful presentations, uh, I felt really uh, an important thing that came out rather at the beginning of our session and in some of the other presentations is the concern about uh, diversity and inclusion and the fact that everyone deserves to conduct field research as safely as possible. And uh, Chris mentioned some issues of uh, sexual harassment and you know, just other concerns for people that need to be safe under the, all conditions for working in the field. And I'll ask him to come in in a second, we'll come back to that. Uh, the same level of planning and, and discussion for laboratory biosafety should be considered for field work. 
those are part of the, you know, how do you extrapolate the existing biosafety principles that we already use in biomedical institutions and try to bring those as best as you can into some of the field work we're doing. These um, biosafety uh, challenges are inherent in wildlife field work, both on what John Bryan talked about as the macro level, things such as climate and seasonality, terrain, and even the equipment that you're using, and also the micro level, such as issues with animal diseases or zoonotic diseases, trauma, euthanasia, and even some type of toxic exposure. These different scales are really important to consider in these biosafety and hazard uh, field hazard protocols. Uh, biosafety, again, is not limited just to pathogen exposure because it can include working with dangerous, such as venomous animals, both within the lab and natural settings. And all of these must be identified and addressed when you're planning your field work. We talked about uh, responding to urgent conservation threats, and that was discussed both with BD and BSAO and white nose syndrome, that coordinated disease research and management activities require biosafety protocols to help guide that work and to prevent further spread. We talked about uh, examples of standards of practice, as I mentioned earlier, standards of biosafety practices that was exemplified by the White Nose Syndrome National Response Community working in partnership with the federal and the state permitting agencies, a good collab, uh, example of collaboration to manage inherent risks in studying these emerging wildlife diseases, again, both in the field and in the laboratory. And when you have these disease-driven wildlife population declines, what are these ethical choices of which species to study and the numbers of individuals available for that research you have to recognize uh, there could be a trade-off that the research to address the problem may potentially further reduce those wild populations, particularly if they're you know, sensitive species, endangered species to be considered. Um, another big issue that we talked about, it was brought up in, in several presentations, and I know John Ryan had really emphasized this, is that the, the principal investigator and the IA cook or the oversight committee has to be informed on a wide variety of species specific, environmental, pharmacological, infectious disease issues for all the species that would be involved, both the target animals, the ones that are under study, and even the non-target animals that are incidentally you know, involved in the study or caught in the, the traps. That includes also people, plants, and even invertebrates. We can't forget the invertebrates as well. And that's a lot of of uh, expertise that an IA cook may not have. So where do you get the expertise? That's the big question. Some of those questions came up through uh, the audience. I know, and how do you find the expertise to address some of these risks? Well, part of it is you either add some of those experts to your IA cook committee, or they can actually be advisors to the IA cook committee to help fill these gaps and improve some of the um, oversight competence of the committee. And so at the end, this is why it's essential as we mentioned earlier, for the IACUC and the Ox Safety and Health or the EHS program uh, committees to be collaborative partners and to work with the PIs to determine what the best field safety protocols, biosafety plans are for field research activities and also for laboratories if those animals are coming into captivity. So I'll, I'll just reach out as well to, uh, to our speakers and ask if they would like to maybe expand upon some of those key messages that I identified. I would first reach out maybe to, to Chris Parkinson and particularly at the, that he brought up this issue of how do you recognize some of these situations um, as far as everyone conducting research safely. And I know you mentioned specifically concerns with sexual harassment or diversity inclusion. Do, would you have any further comments on that, Chris? I mean, I think the biggest thing is training, going out and, and getting the information. There are a lot of articles coming out in the last uh, couple of years on DEA uh, situations in field safety. Um, we can post a lot of those. Dan made a great list that he sent out with some that I didn't have. There's a new one that just came out in EcoBioRx uh, just last week. Um, but, you know, field safety is paramount, and that's just not your physical safety, that's your mental safety as well. And, and we need to be aware of this as PIs, um, making sure our students understand that these are potential aspects and can occur and, and how we work uh, as teams to mitigate that. Thank you. 
That's that's perfect. Thanks. This to me is a big issue of, of safety, field safety, not just the, like you said, the physical and biological hazards, but the psychological hazards as well. I think that really needs to be uh, well addressed. And also, like you said, reinforced by a lot of training before folks are actually doing the work in the field, especially in remote situations. Um, I was going to reach out actually to, to John Bryan as well. And he, he talked a lot about inherent risks in field work, but where do you find that expertise? And I know a lot of the questions that have come in from the audience today have been along those same lines, like, you know, how do we find these experts? Where are they? And how can they help the IACUC? So John, do you want to touch a little bit more on that? Sure, I'll be happy to. Um, so where to find the knowledge, the, the firepower to kind of beef up the experience on the committee? Um, to make informed decisions and reviews. So the, the simple answer is, is that it's, it's, you may be surprised that there are people right underneath your nose. Um, I talked a little bit about earlier, kind of on the sidelines with some of the other presenters about the importance of state wildlife agencies uh, and other people in that arena. If you are um, at an institution that's got wildlife activities on the, on the docket for your oversight committee, um, a good place to start to get your foot in the door might be to approach your state wildlife agency. Um, your state, state wildlife agency, depending on you know, where they are in the country, uh, might have an eye cook anywhere. And they might be able to have somebody uh, provide a wealth of knowledge and experience to help your committee that doesn't usually deal with free range species activities um, come to an informed review on that. Um, there are other folks out there, I'm kind of dancing around putting in a shameless plug for myself, but um, I'd be very happy to help anybody who's, who's looking for that. Um, but these are the places you can start. And actually, to tell you the truth, uh, the fact that you all signed up for this workshop, uh, there are a lot of presenters today and tomorrow who have this expertise. Hold on to this, this, this presenter roster and don't be afraid to reach out. Um, Dr. Sykes and I have been presenting this kind of stuff for well over a decade now, and we always close things with offering our email addresses or contact information, um, but feel free to, to kind of flip through this roster of presenters for this workshop, and I'm sure almost any of us, if not all of us, would not hesitate to help you out. Um, I hope that answers the question. I think that might be in the ballpark. That sounds great. Thanks, John. Um, there's a couple other questions that have come in and, and comments that were made in the presentations, particularly when it came to the sort of novel introduction of these um, emerging infectious diseases. And particularly if there's importation, as we believe, with B-cell or possibly with white nose syndrome and even West Nile virus many years ago, you know, as we know, not only the pet trade, but just uh, airline traffic, you know, people traveling globally, everything is moving at the speed of sound or faster these days. So look at SARS-CoV-2. I mean, we have seen, you know, a global pandemic not necessarily spread through wildlife trade, but we realize how fast pathogens can move around the globe these days. So I was going to ask Karen if she might have some additional thoughts, particularly about, you know, if we don't have existing policies or regulations in place, you know, what are other things that we can consider doing as far as introduction of these novel diseases and how does the research community sort of present itself or, or stage itself to you know, sort of help figure out some of this, this discovery in this new science? Thanks, Patty. That's a, that's a great question. Um, it's, it's going to be tough. I think it's gonna require primarily communication and cooperation and coordination because what what is happening here in the US is just as likely to happen in any other country with infectious diseases and where where the problem starts first we can get that information and share that information as quickly as possible with our partners around the world um, kind of tagging off of what John said about communication uh, scientific societies, field stations, um, I mentioned the B-cell task force. There are existing groups of people who are doing research on this, either government or non-governmental groups, researchers 
And if you can find a website with somebody who's working on it, they can direct you to the appropriate um, person or group that can help you um, mobilize a response or get the information out. Perfect. Yeah, and I was just thinking that somebody who many years ago in my early career worked with the Whooping Crane Reintroduction Program between Canada and the US. I mean, there was a lot of work on the research side, right, with some of the uh, biosafety protocols, we had to test those animals you know, before they were transported from the captive propagation facilities that I used to work at at the Tuxent Wildlife Research Center. You know, when all those animals were being prepared to be introduced into the wild or to be reintroduced in, in some cases, all the work that went into health and safety concerns, not only of the population that was in captivity, but the ones that were also in the wild, right? So we weren't taking um, infection inadvertently from a captive population and putting it into the wild. So all of that, that dialogue that happened both nationally, internationally, and through those types of working groups uh, was really helpful in getting that program to be successful and making sure the birds were healthy when they were brought out. And that actually leads me to your partner. Let me go over to Vance, because that is a, a question that came up about ethical considerations. You touched on that a little bit with some of the amphibian work that you've been involved in but reintroducing animals into the wild. And in the research perspective, sometimes animals are brought from the wild into a, a research facility to study them. Are those animals that have been in temporary captivity, can they be returned back to their original site? Is that, you know, is that questionable? Or what about, like I mentioned, actually breeding animals in captivity for reintroduction purposes? You know, how does that play out with some of the biosafety concerns that we would have as far as not introducing or reintroducing unintentional pathogens? I think that's a great point. Um, you know, uh, as we uh, face the bio, um, biodiversity crisis and try to do something where we're doing research in many cases with the end game being we're trying to solve these issues where species are, are being threatened perhaps because of human activities. Um, you know, getting getting these um, populations to um, stabilize again sometimes takes a lot of intervention. And I think, I think the um, I, I think in particular the IACUC um, framework is a really great way to get people to communicate um, across uh, different platforms. So, for example, working with zoos and researchers. When I first started working on a project where we were going to reintroduce animals into the wild. Um, uh, my Aya Cook at the university was not open to that idea at all. But the zoos, because they had a history of working under the context of um, the, the very real context of conservation um, as like one of their pillars that wasn't really in research, but it was at the, it was at the zoos, their Aya Cook committee uh, was much more open to that idea. And so after years of communication between our committees, um, you know, we've, we've sort of moved forward. And I think, I think we need more of that. Um, but certainly, you know, we, we are in these situations now where we, we, um, we've done discovery. So we've discovered a pathogen that wasn't known. And then we bring that pathogen into the lab and start learning about how those um, pathogens interact, pathogen or pathogens interact with individuals of different species. Um, and then we want to try to take what we learn in the lab and take it back to the field. So there's definitely this need to go back and forth. And I think the IACUC um, framework is the way that we need to get that communication going across these different platforms from the wildlife people to the research people to the zoo community people. Great comment. And it actually leads me to sort of my last sort of question that I was going through from a lot of the questions submitted today it was a relatively recent one that asked, how do you distinguish between the responsibilities of the Aya Cook, the Ox Safety Health or Environmental Health and Safety teams or programs evaluating these wildlife activities? So how is that, that sort of dynamic you know, worked out, obviously with the, the principal investigator, I mean, the PI to me is also the expert in this discussion, right? They're the ones who are leading the study. So I was going to first turn to John Bryan, I think, if you wanted to maybe tackle that, and then any of the other session speakers, if you have some other thoughts, uh, again, on this sort of dynamic of working with the IACUC and these uh, safety and health NPIs. 
Sure, thanks, Patty. Yeah, that was a question that was just posted on the chat. So, um, there with with an eye cook that you know is registered with OLAW and is doing the guide. You know, there there's a direct relationship between the oversight body and Oc Health. Um, but if you've got a different setup at your institution, so to speak, um, how do you manage that conversation? How do you manage that collaboration between you know reviewing an animal use protocol and making sure that you know folks aren't going out into the field and acting the fool um, and getting hurt or getting exposed to dangerous things. Um, so like I said earlier in the presentation, the Animal Welfare Act does not does not say, does not give IACOCs the mandate to organize or manage occupational health for the institutions they serve. However, there is a lot of overlap in review of animal use protocols that has to do with safety, biosecurity and biosafety of the animals under study in the environment that absolutely overlaps with human health. And that is where you can manage this sort of thing. Um, for instance, uh, this is especially in play when you talk about disease transmission. Uh, zoonosis is kind of a no brainer. If you are employing I mean, if, they, if the IACUC is demanding mitigation strategies to an AUP that uh, speak to diminishing risk of disease transmission between animals you're studying, then the conduit is you as, as the handler. So there is every bit uh, of authority there to demand that human safety be inherently tied to not transferring disease from one animal to the other. In other words, wearing gloves is a simple one. It also protects animal A from being getting a disease from animal B, but it also protects the human from also getting the disease from animal A as well. Um, you know, issues like rabies and this kind of stuff, this is a no-brainer. Hantavirus, et cetera. Um, these are ways that you can initiate this kind of dialogue and start this. Um, so, but I, I, would, I would argue that, that a, a team that goes into the field um, that demands that the IACUC kind of look the other way or not examine or ask these kind of questions about OC Health is doing kind of a less than ideal review. Um, yes, an IACUC that's not registered with OLA um, doesn't really have the mandate to oversee OC Health, but they have every right to ask questions about it. And they have every right to interview the PI and the team to ensure that proper precautions are being taken uh, to make sure that that protocol is safe in the field. And I guess in the presentation, it's almost inevitable. It will almost always be um, the case that what's safe for the animals and what's safe for the environment hosting the project will be also safe for the human beings. Um, so. Excellent. Um, any others on the session yes, three speakers? Good. I'd like to jump in, thanks. This is Nicolette. Oh, so okay. from from the OLA perspective, it's very clear that the Occupational Health and Safety Program is an institutional responsibility. However, IACUCs are responsible for all animal care and use within their institutions. And it's a spider web, right? Just like John was explaining, there are lots of, of impacts. So if there are safety issues that could be related to training, if there are safety issues that might impact the animals, that's an animal welfare issue, especially in terms of zoonosis. What if you bring it back to the animals in the laboratory? Um, so there are human and animal aspects intertwined, and there are also research aspects. What if the occupational health and safety issues are, are so worrisome that you're worried that the research goals won't even be accomplished? So there are a lot of reasons why the IACUC should be an active participant, but also consult with experts in the occupational health and safety arena to help them evaluate protocols in light of occupational health and safety issues. That's a great point. And actually we're all living through SARS-CoV-2 right now, and obviously not just about the human pandemic, but all of the work that, and discussions that have happened over the course of two years at the federal state uh, university research levels as to whether we can actually go safely into the field, not only to protect human health, but also to protect potentially what we call at-risk species, right? We've all been watching the news. We've seen, you know, pet dogs and cats infected by their COVID positive owners. We've seen a number of zoo 
you know, large cats, lions, tigers, um, you know, leopards, you know, er, uh, Canada lynx, you know, we've seen a number of the, the large felids, we've seen gorillas. We've realized that and now white-tailed deer, just to add that to the interesting discussion, uh, free-ranging white-tailed deer. So we realize that this novel virus that has somehow been introduced you know, globally to the human population is now a spillover event, certainly into domestic and wild animals. We don't know whether it may be a spillback event, but how that affected research. In many cases, research was postponed or in some cases canceled or altered in some way over the course of the past couple of years. And I know John Riker can speak to that. He mentioned it, I think, in his presentation, particularly with bats. I mean, that was one of the first keystone species that everybody had their hair on fire, if you don't mind saying so, because we worry they already are being decimated by white nose syndrome and introduced fungal pathogen. And we don't know whether North American bats had a similar susceptibility as you know Asian bats considered sort of the reservoir for the prototype SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, or progenitor virus, we didn't know if they would be susceptible or not. And so a lot of research and frankly, some management activities for white nose syndrome and studying bat populations across the North American continent came to a screeching halt in many ways. I mean, that is a, an unfortunate circumstance just for science and for us to learn more about white nose syndrome and how to manage that. But we didn't want to introduce yet a second disease on top of that that could create even a, a sort of a worse risk. Um, John, did you have any other thoughts on that, John Reichert? I mean, just looking through that kind of situation through the lens of also a, a regulatory agency that is issuing permits. Yeah, I, I think you covered it really well, Patty. And we, we definitely had a, a very quick sort of adoption of, of those high precaution approaches with, with largely hands off unless there was critical activity that that had to happen, um, but we very quickly wanted to move back. So shuff, putting that that effort into really identifying where the um, how we could safely move back into into those those activities was important. Another um, consideration as we did that was the potential um, public perception of of what we were doing and, and what that would mean for the wildlife we were we were working with. So as we take this precautionary approach with with um, working with bats, the perception to the public could then be that bats are dangerous, that, that there is this threat coming from the bats. Um, whereas in reality, what we were doing was trying to protect the bats from the threat we were posing to them. Um, had we allowed that that misperception to occur, that could again have have even worse consequences for the bats down the road. Exactly, and a lot of that discussion was again about biosafety and biosecurity in the field, but in both directions, right? Not only protecting humans who were traveling to the field and working with colleagues and being safe themselves, but also wearing the right type of personal protective equipment, face masks, gloves, whatever was necessary to prevent or at least minimize potential risk to introduce this novel SARS-CoV-2 virus to whatever species you were working on. So that brings us full circle back around to the issues of field safety and biosafety and how that has to percolate through the research community and with all of the people sitting around and having this uh, thoughtful conversation together. Um, last thing, I just want to make sure that I mentioned as far as looking for expertise on all these different species, uh, to assist the IACUCs or the PIs or the Ox Safety and Health folks is again to reach out to our tax on specific associations, Association um, Society of Mammalogy, Ornithological Council, et cetera, uh, even the, the Association of uh, American Fish Society, excuse me, and the Fish and, and Icks and Herps. So all of these other uh, professional associations also are there to provide some guidance and, and add additional expertise into the discussion. So um, I'll turn everything back over to our moderator host for this afternoon. Okay, thank you. Um, we just have a few minutes. Uh, so if there's more synergistic discussion, this third session started getting cross-cutting. So if anybody has another topic, we've got about five minutes left uh, among the chairs, if you'd like to bring something else up.
Okay, I'll, I'll throw a quick question out there. Some, there was a question that came in about standardized IACUC protocols. I think that goes across um, a lot of the things we discussed today. I didn't know if anyone, um, moderator speakers, had any thoughts about making standardized IACUC protocols. I worry that you don't necessarily have a one size that fits all, but there is some value in having certain standardized protocols. So the researchers don't have to continue to rewrite every time they submit a new study uh, protocol write the same information over and over again? I think there's certainly a, a lot of value to that in, in exactly what you said, saving time and, and not reinventing the wheel each time. But I, I do think that a, a hallmark of many of the presentations through session two was the need for flexibility and the need to think outside the box and you know, uh, deal with the situation at hand rather than, you know, relying on precedent, which may be historically unclear, you know, may, may not be clear why a rule is in place or why, you know, a, a standard practice is in place and, and it, may, it may end up hampering doing something really valuable. So there's probably a balance there between, you know, providing some standardization, but also leaving that flexibility that we need. Yeah, I completely agree with Sharon. I do think that having those categories so that you know we have the some general um, guidance, you know, specifically for the um, as we had talked about earlier, you know, what are those what are those specific activities or those specific specific items that the IACUC really needs to know about, you know, and so having some of those in a standardized protocol or standardized forms, but yet still being able to um, add in specific variation, I think is probably the, the best way to approach it. So we had one other question that was in here related to a catch 22, you know, where the IACUCs want a permit before they approve a protocol or the, um, can you get the approval before you get the permit? Anyone want to tackle that one? I'd like to tackle, to tackle that one. <laughs> I'm happy to. Um, so it happens quite frequently, actually, uh, especially when you're doing international field work. And what we've done or what we did while I was I cut chair at University of Central Florida was the PI signed off a, a statement that said they will and are responsible to garner all of the required permits to carry out said research in this protocol. And then a lot of times um, on our annual renewals and things, we would look at those per, uh, permits because it was post them doing the work. And so they would have them. All right. <clears throat> yes, that, that's basically what we have here too. We have to show our permits, but we don't need them to get our IACUC protocol approved. Actually, Bill, could I add something to that? Sure. Um, what Sharon just said about precedent and institutional policy and procedure and um, the program's culture and what is the root of the issue here, I, I think, because like others were saying, there are international issues here that you don't have control over. And so you're trying to get your researcher into this space to facilitate the work safely. And also then if there are these other barriers, really take a look, use those semi-annual program review times to analyze and look at what is going on and why is it there? Ask the questions, that's an opportunity to show your researchers the good faith effort the committee and the program is making to work collaboratively and to communicate and to get stakeholder input. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, we're coming right up against five o'clock. Um, and uh, the, this is definitely a catch 22 issue at the very end. So <laughs> one thing I'm just gonna start, I'm gonna thank all of our chairs, our presenters for their excellent overviews and answer to our questions. Um, those questions that aren't answered during the sessions are going to be addressed in the transcript of the meetings. 
Um, we've been overwhelmed with the number of questions. And we remember we have over 1,700 people across the world that are registered for this uh, workshop. So this is the end of our first day. We will reconvene at 10 a.m. Eastern U.S. time tomorrow, same time as today. We look forward to your participation tomorrow. So good morning, good afternoon, or good night, depending on where you are viewing this in the world. And we'll see you tomorrow. So thank you.